Chapter 15, Sharks and Bullets On the morning of the 27th day, a plane came. It began with a rumble of engines and then a spot in the sky. It was a twin-engine bomber moving west at a brisk clip. It was so far away that expending the flares and die was questionable. The men conferred and voted. They decided to take a shot. Louis fired one flare, reloaded, then fired a second, drawing vivid lines around the sky. He opened a dye container and spilled its contents into the ocean, then dug out the mirror and angled a square of light toward the bomber. The men waited, hoping. The plane grew smaller, then faded away. As the castaways slumped in the rafts, trying to accept another lost chance, over the western horizon there was a glimmer, tracing a wide curve, then banking toward the rafts. The bomber was coming back. Weeping with joy, Louis, Phil, and Mac tugged their shirts over their heads and snapped them back and forth in the air, calling out. The bomber leveled off, skimming over the water. Louis squinted at the cockpit. He made out two silhouettes, a pilot and co-pilot. He thought of Palmeria, food, solid ground underfoot. And then, all at once, the ocean erupted. There was a deafening noise, and the rafts began hope hopping and shuddering under the castaways. The gunners were firing at them. Louis, Phil, and Matt clawed for the raft walls and threw themselves overboard. They swam under the rafts and huddled there, watching bullets tear through the rafts and cut bright slits into the water around them. Then the firing stopped. The men surfaced. The bomber had overshot them and was now to the east, moving away. Two sharks were nosing around. The men had to get out of the water immediately. Clinging to the side of Louis and Mac's rafts, Phil was completely done in. The leap into the water had taken everything that was left of him. He floundered, unable to pull himself over the raft wall. Louis swam up behind him and gave him a push, and Phil slopped up on board. Mac, too, needed Louis's help to climb over the wall. Louis then dragged himself up, and the three sat there, stunned but uninjured. They couldn't believe that the airmen, mistaking them for Japanese, would strafe unarmed castaways. Under them, the raft felt doughy and was leaking air. In the distance, the bomber swung around and began firing at the rafts, flying at the rafts. Louis hoped the crew had realized the mistake and was returning to help them. Flying about 200 feet over the water, the bomber raced at them, following a path slightly parallel to the rafts, so that its side passed into view. All three men saw it at once. Behind the wing, painted over the waist, was a red circle. The bomber was Japanese. Louis saw the gunners taking aim and knew he had to go back in the water. Phil and Mac didn't move. They were both exhausted. They knew if they went back overboard again, they wouldn't be strong enough to get back in, and the sharks would take them. If they stayed on the raft, it seemed impossible that the gunners could miss them. As the bombers flew toward them, they lay down. Phil put his knees to his chest and covered his head in his hands. Mac balled himself up beside him. Louis took a last glance at them, then dropped into the water and swam back under the rafts. The bullets showered the ocean in a glittering downpour. Looking up, Louis saw them popping through the canvas, shooting beams of intensely bright tropical sunlight through the raft's shadow. But after a few feet, the bullets spent their force and fluttered down, fizzing. Louis straightened his arms over his head and pushed against the bottom of one of the rafts, trying to get far enough down to be outside the bullet's lethal range. Above him, he could see the depressions formed by Mac and Phil's body. Neither man was moving. As the bullets raked overhead, Louis struggled to stay under the rafts. The current clutched him, rotating his body horizontally and dragging him away. He kicked against it, but it was no use. He was being sucked away, and he knew that if he lost touch with the rafts, he wouldn't be able to swim hard enough against the current to get back. As he was pulled loose, he saw the long cord that strayed off the end of the rafts. He grabbed it and tied it around his waist. As he lay underwater, his legs tugged in front of him with the current, Louis looked down at his feet. His left sock was pulled up to his chin, his right had slipped halfway off. He watched it flap in the current. Then, in the murky blur beyond it, he saw the huge, gaping mouth of a shark emerge out of the darkness and rush straight at his legs. Louis recoiled, pulled his legs toward his body. The current was too strong for him to get his legs beneath him, but he was able to swing them to one side, away from the shark's mouth. The shark kept coming directly at Louis's head. Louis remembered the advice of the old man in Honolulu. Make a threatening expression, then stiff-arm the shark's snout. As the shark lunged for his head, Louis bared his teeth, widened his eyes, and rammed his palm into the tip of the shark's nose. The shark flinched, circled away, then swam back for a second pass. Louis waited until the shark was inches from him, then struck it in the nose again. Again, the shark filled away. Above, the bullets had stopped coming. As quickly as he could, Louis pulled himself along the cord until he reached the raft. He grabbed the wall and lifted himself clear of the shark. Mac and Phil were lying together in the fetal position. They were absolutely still, and bullet holes draped the raft around them. Louis shook Mac. Mac made a sound. Louis asked if he'd been hit. Mac said no. Louis spoke to Phil. Phil said he was okay. 
The bomber circled back for another go. Phil and Mac played dead, and Louis tipped back into the ocean. As bullets knifed the water around him, the shark came at him, and again Louis bumped his snout and recalled it. Then a second shark charged at him. Louis hung there, gyrating in the water and flailing his arms and legs as the shark snapped at him and the bullets came down. That's something you got, like sharks going at you at one end and bullets coming down the other. The moment the bomber sped out of firing range, he clambered under the raft again. Phil and Mac were still unhit. Four more times the Japanese strafed them, sending Louis into the water to kick and punch the sharks until the bomber had passed. Then he fought them to the point of exha exhaustion. He was, Though he fought them to the point of exhaustion, he was not bitten. Every time he emerged from the water, he was certain that Phil and Mac would be dead, and possibly, though there were bullet holes all around them, even in the tiny spaces between them, not one bullet had hit either man. The bomber crew made a last gesture of sadism. The plane circled back and Louis ducked into the water again. The plane's bomb bay doors rolled open and a depth charge tumbled out, splashing down some 50 feet from the rafts. The men braced themselves for an explosion, but none came. Either the charger was a dud or the bombarder had forgotten to arm it. If the Japanese are this inept, Phil thought, America will win this war. They got so lucky there. You know, the sharks, the bullets, the bomb even doesn't go off. Louis rolled back onto the raft and collapsed. When the bomber came back, he was too tired to go overboard. As the plane passed the final time, Louis, Mac, and Phil lay still. The gunners didn't fire. The bomber flew west and disappeared. Phil's raft had been slashed in two. A bullet had struck the airport air pump and ricocheted straight across the base of the raft, slitting it from end to end. Everything that had been in the raft had been lost in the water. Because the ruined raft was made for rubberized canvas, it didn't sink, but it was obviously far beyond repair. Shrunken and formless, it lapped about on the ocean surface. The men were sardined together on what remained of Mac and Louis's raft, which was far too small for all three of them. The canvas was speckled with tiny bullet holes. The raft had two air chambers, but both were punctured. Each time one of the men moved, air sighed out of the chambers of the canvas, and the canvas wrinkled a little more. The raft sat lower and lower in the water, and the sharks whipped around it, surely excited by the bullets, the sight and smell of the men in the water, and the sinking raft. As the men sat together, exhausted and in shock, a shark lunged up over the wall of the raft, mouth open, trying to drag a man into the ocean. Someone grabbed an oar and hit the shark, and it slid off. Then another shark jumped on, and another, and another. The men gripped the oars and wheeled about, frantically swinging at the sharks. As they turned and swung and the sharks flopped, air was forced out of the bullet holes, and the raft sank deeper. Soon, part of the raft was completely submerged. If the men didn't get into the raft immediately, the sharks would take them. One pump had been lost in the strapping, and only the one from Mac and Louie's raft remained. The men hooked it up to one of the two valves and took turns pumping as hard as they could. Air flowed into the chamber and seeped out through the bullet holes, but the men found that if they pumped very quickly, just enough air passed through the raft to lift it up out of the water and keep it mostly inflated. The sharks kept coming, and the men kept beating them away. As Phil and Mac pumped and struck at the sharks, Louie groped for the provisions pocket and grabbed the patching kit which contained sheets of patching material, a tube of glue, and sandpaper to roughen up the raft surface so the glue could adhere. The first problem declared itself immediately. The sandpaper wasn't waterproof. When Louis pulled it out, only the paper emerged. The sand had been, struck, had been stuck to it had washed off for the umpteenth time. Louis cursed whoever had stalked the raft. He had to devise something that could etch up the patch area so the glue would stick. He pondered the problem, then picked up the brass mirror that he had used to hail the bomber. Using the pliers, he cut three teeth into the edge of the mirror. Phil and Mac kept the sharks at bay. Louis began patching, starting with the holes in the top of the raft. He lifted the perforated area clear of the water, wiped the water from the surface, and held it away from the waves, letting it dry in the sun. Then, with each perforation, he used the mirror edge to cut an X across the hole. The material consisted of two layers of canvas with rubber in between. After cutting the X, he peeled the canvas to reveal the rubber layer, used the mirror to scratch up the rubber, squeezed glue onto it, and stuck the patch on. Then he waited for the sun to dry to the glue. Sometimes a white cap would drench the patch before it dried, and he'd have to begin again. As Louis worked, keeping his eyes on the patches, the, shark kept, the sharks kept snapping at him. Growing wiser, they gave up flinging themselves haphazardly at the men and began stalking about, waiting for a moment when an oar was down or a back was turned before bullying their way aboard. Over and over again, they lunged at Louis from behind where he couldn't see them. Mac and Phil smacked them away. Hour after hour, the men worked, rotating the duties, clumsy with fatigue. The, the pumping was an enormous exertion for the diminished men. They found that instead of standing the pump up and pushing the handle downward, it was easier to press the pump handle to their chest and pull the base toward themselves. 
All three men were indispensable. Had there only been two, they couldn't have pumped, passed, and repelled the sharks. For the first time on the raft, Mac was truly helpful. He was barely strong enough to pull the pump handle a few times in a row, but with the oar, he kept every shark at bay. Night fell, and the darkness passing was impossible, but the pumping couldn't be stopped. They pumped all night long, so drained that they lost feeling in their arms. In the morning, the patching resumed. The rate of air loss gradually lessened, and they were able to rest for longer periods. Eventually, the air held enough for them to begin brief sleep rotations. In the morning, the patching resumed. The rate of air loss gradually lessened, and they were able to long eventually brief sleep rotations. Once the top pat was patched, there was the problem of patching the bottom, which was underwater. All three men squeezed on the one side of the raft, balancing on one air tube then opened up the valve and let the air out of the side that they were sitting on, lifted it out of the water, turned it over the bottom facing skyward, wiped it off, and held it up to dry. Then Louis began patching. When that half of the bottom was patched, they reinflated it, crawled up to the repaired side, deflated the other side, and repeated the process. Again, white caps repeatedly washed over the raft and spoiled the patches, and everything had to be redone. Finally, they could do, have find no more holes to patch. Because bubbles kept coming up around the sides of the raft, they knew that there were holes someplace where they couldn't reach. They had to live with them. The patches had slowed the air loss dramatically. Even when struck by white caps, white caps, the patches held. The men found that they could cut back on their pumping to one session every 15 minutes or so during the day, and not and none at night. When the raft now reasonably inflated, the sharks stopped attacking. Losing Phil's raft was a heavy blow. Not only had they lost all the items stored in it, but the three men were wedged in a two-man raft, so close together that to move, each man had to ask others to give him room. There was so little space that they had to take turns straightening their legs. At night, they had to sleep in a bony pile, feet to head. But two good things came from the strapping. Looking at the dead raft, Louis thought of, it use, thought of use for it. Using the pliers, he pulled apart the layers of canvas of the ruined raft, creating a large light sheet. At last, they had a canopy to block the sun in the daytime and the cold at night. The other benefit of the strapping was the information it gave the men. When they had a moment to collect themselves, Louis and Phil discussed the Japanese bomber. They thought that it must have come from the Marshall or Gilbert Islands. If they were right in their belief, then they were drifting directly west, and the Marshalls and Gilberts were roughly equi equidistant from them. They thought that the bomber had probably been on sea stretch, and if the Japanese followed the same sea search procedures as the Americans, it would have taken off at around 7 a.m., a few hours before it had reached the rafts. Estimating the bomber's cruising speed and range, they made rough calculations to arrive at how many hours the bomber could remain airborne after it left them, and thus how far away they were from its base. They guessed that they were 850 miles from the bomber's base. If this was correct, given that they had crashed about 2,000 miles east of the Marshalls and Gilberts, they had already traveled more than half the distance to the islands that they were covering more than 40 miles per day. Phil thought over the numbers and was surprised. They had no idea that they were so far west. Extra pointing from these figures, they made educated guesses of when they'd reach the islands. Phil guessed the 46th day. Louis guessed the 47th. And their figures were right. They were going to have to last about twice as long as Rickenbacker. That meant surviving on the raft for almost three more weeks. It was frightening to imagine what might await them on those islands. The strapping had confirmed that they'd heard about the Japanese, but it was a good, good to feel orientated to know that they were drifting toward land somewhere out there, on the far side of the Earth's tilt. The bomber had given them something to ground their hope. Mac didn't join in on the prognostication. He was slipping away. Mac didn't join in on the prognostication. He was slipping away. That was uh, chapter 15 of Laura Hildebrand's book, Unbroken. Um, all three guys are still alive. They're on the raft and they're drifting towards Japanese uh, controlled islands. They're still alive, they're fighting off the sharks and the bullets and the heat and everything else. And uh, after reading this, just be grateful that you're not there. Or a lot of other places that a lot of uh, humans had had to go. So, not everybody uh, has everything, so be grateful for what you have.